have a word of prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, we pray that you would quiet our hearts this evening as we reflect on your death at Calvary. And uh, we want to first um, thank you that you were willing to lay down your life for us. Uh, we know that you gave it freely, and uh, we bless you for that. Uh, we uh, don't know what it's like to die, and we don't know yet, and we don't know what it's like to die with great pain and uh, physical pain and suffering, uh, to be brutally beaten and uh, scourged, and to be cruci crucified. Uh, we have no clue, Lord, um, how difficult uh, that was. And we are so clueless as to how much sin uh, you took uh, on yourself at Calvary uh, for each and every one of us. Uh, we, um, we humble our hearts this evening. Uh, we bless you. Uh, for forgiveness of sin. Uh, we thank you that you were fearless and dauntless and so persevering and so loving and so kind and so good uh, to make that trip uh, to Calvary. And uh, we only have a, a glimpse and a sense of what all that means, this side of heaven. Uh, but we uh, thank you that we can praise you now, and that we'll praise you for all eternity for what you did at the cross. 
And so we, we bless you tonight. We pray that you would quiet our hearts and our minds in all these things uh, that we might reflect and seek to enter into that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this evening is from the second chapter of Colossians, verses 8 through 15, and that's found on page 1143 of the Church Bible. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This is the word of our Lord. So I appreciate Bill stepping in and reading last minute as I corralled him there to do so. Appreciate it, Bill. Uh, let's, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, speak to our hearts this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, folks, uh, it's no secret that we're living in cancel culture today, and they're canceling everything. Um, I don't know if you've been canceled yet. <clears throat> Hopefully not. Uh, but they cancel Twitter accounts, uh, free speech, people's reputations, and values that are held near and dear. Uh, now, uh, whether you know this or not, shame is coming right behind it, right? They not only cancel you, but now they shame you because shame is part of cancel culture. So this is just the beginning. Uh, Drew and I were talking yesterday, but he was telling me about how the five or six largest U.S. banks are talking about implementing what's called ESG. Uh, Now, if you don't know what ESG stands for, it stands for Environmental and social governance, governance, if I can say that right. And basically what it is, it's a rating to determine, get this, whether the financial institutions will do business with you. Now, if you have a business, they'll determine whether your rating in terms of the environment and the social issues muster enough uh, of a grade uh, where they will work with you. Uh, So what it basically is, is it's economic cancel culture. And, and so, obviously, it's hard not to see where this is going. As you read the book of Revelation, it tells us that uh, buying and selling uh, will not take place with anyone unless they have a mark. Now, here's the funny thing. I was reflecting on this because there's one thing that they're not canceling today. Do you know what, anybody know what it is? There's one thing that they are not canceling and that they will never cancel. Anybody know? Your debt. Think about it. They'll never cancel your financial debt. Now, politicians may talk about it for votes, right? But the institutions will always reject it because it's at the heart of their livelihood and their control. Tell me what bank will ever, if you ever took a loan, will cancel your debt? Name one that you know of that's actually doing that right now. I, for the life of me, just could not think of just one, right? 
Now, you will find debt consolidation agencies uh, to consolidate uh, your debt, not cancel it. Uh, by the way, I was reflecting on this. Uh, I'll bet you if you could do enough research, they're probably owned by the credit companies anyway, credit card companies. Uh, but anyway, what they will do is they will unleash lawyers if you have enough debt to extract everything out of you that they can. Or what they do is they pass it off to what? Collection agencies, you know, those pesky collection agencies. Now, I want to go on record here this evening, and I'll, and I'll get to Colossians passage, but this is the Colossians passage, passage, but this is kind of like a setup, right? So I want to go on record to say fundamentally, I don't think anybody's debt should be canceled. I think people should pay their bills. Uh, that's the way I was brought up. Uh, Romans 8, uh, 13, 8, uh, owe no man anything. You pay your bills. People need to be held accountable for the decisions that they make, amen? You take a loan, you take student loans, you sign on the dotted line, you should know what you're signing on, uh, off on. So people should be held accountable for the decisions that they make. And I don't think that somebody should run up the bills and then dump their debt so you and I, the people who pay our bills, you know, uh, pick up the tab for them. That's just not fair, right? It's wrong. But that's the culture that you're living in. Now, I want to say this too. I think that there's extenuating of circumstances where, you know, people will never get out from underneath the debt. And so there might be occasion where you need to file bankruptcy. Uh, if, if you were to read the Constitution, uh, the framers talked about that. Uh, they set up for bankruptcy laws. Bill, you're probably a little bit more familiar with this because you went to school for law and especially tax law. But in 1833, they actually passed a law actually making sure that you don't have to be imprisoned for your debt. But up until that time, they were throwing you in jail. They get you out of jail now so you would pay it back, you see. Because if you're in jail, you can't pay it back. Uh, and I would say this, uh, filing bankruptcy should be a means of last resort. Now, the other thing I want to say is we've all felt the stress of having bills, having debt, uh, and it's, to say the least, unsettling. The bottom line is if uh, it, it can ruin you, right? You worry yourself sick over it. Uh, I've counseled Christians through the years uh, on how to get out of debt, 30000 80,000, 100,000, 120,000. It's insane. And what it is, is it's, it's financial enslavery and, and, and bondage. Uh, I, I wish, I, I wish, I wish, I wish that more people were educated about this danger. And I wish that our politicians would seriously take into consideration the debt that they're running up nationally. Now, that being said, You'll see how all this kind of somewhat fits in with the, with the message. Uh, we're going to shift our focus here as we look at Colossians. We're going to shift our focus from monetary debt to spiritual debt because as we look at Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, specifically verses 13 through 15, it has a lot to say about canceling spiritual debt. And I would suggest to you that if we look at this closely, it reveals the heart of God to his children. Uh, now, there are a few passages in Scripture that give us so much information about the gospel of Christ in a couple of lines here, but it addresses the who regarding the gospel, the what regarding the gospel, the when regarding the gospel, the where regarding the gospel, the why, and the how regarding the gospel. And within these verses, Paul lays it all out. And um, it's, it's God's heart to his kids. He cancels our debt. Now, <clears throat> this is important here. It, it's not, and I'm going to try to break these scriptures down for you, it's not only being spiritually debt-free, but if you notice here, I have debt-free plus uh, for the sermon title. It's the plus. The plus goes beyond the canceling of the debt. It's the one thing to cancel debt. It's another thing to go beyond the canceling of debt. Now, let me give you a little bit of background about Colossians. Uh, this is a prison epistle, and the Apostle Paul is in prison for his faith. And he's confined, and yet he's free. 
And he knows personally uh, that his debt spiritually has been canceled. And he seeks to communicate this concisely. Now, uh, the church at Colossae was being bombarded with false teaching. And it was a heresy called Gnosticism. And if you, if you were to know a little bit about this, you, the, the epistle starts to come alive a little bit more in, in, in some very technical ways. But let me give you a, a real quick crash course. If you, if you were a, uh, in that Colossian culture and you had knowledge, they would say that that was spiritually good and enlightening. But what they would also say too is that God did not come and die in a body. And, and so that's obviously heretical. And they also went on to say that Christ wasn't the Son of God, but that he was uh, a way to get closer to God. He was kind of like um, some sort of apparition or some sort of spiritual emanation where you, in your knowledge of getting to God, he was just part of the rung on the ladder, spiritual ladder. And so what, if you read the book of Colossians, Paul sets the record straight. If, if you read chapter 1, he's got this great Christological passage. He's the firstborn. He's before all things. Uh, he, he's made all things in all things. Uh, you know, he, all things consist uh, together in him. And so he's the head of the church. And this great, tremendous, verses 15 through 20 of chapter 1, uh, read it. Uh, perhaps over this weekend. Incredible passage. And this is what Paul says. He's not a rung on the ladder. He's not the top rung on the ladder. He is the ladder. He's Jacob's ladder. Now, Paul doesn't say that, but we know that that's true from John chapter 1. He's preeminent in all things. And, and this is important. So now when we come over to chapter 2, Paul's saying in verse 8, He's expressing concern that people not be held captive or in bondage to what they've been hearing, uh, that they not be led astray. And notice what Paul says here. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition, um, according to the tradition of men, according to elementary principles of the world. I think Paul probably has in mind man-made religion, but I would suggest to you, at least from today's perspective, anything that comes out of your universities, anything that comes out of your spiritual or social think tanks, your intellectual centers of the day, most of it's, if not all of it's garbage. And it's got nothing to do with the gospel. And, 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 and here's the other thing, too, is if you notice uh, when Bill read the passage, there is references to circumcision. So the Colossians had to be somewhat familiar with the Jewish law. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have used the term circumcision. And he moves from the physical circumcision to the spiritual. Now, we always want to keep it simple here, but take a look at verse 10. Because if you want to understand this passage, uh, keep it simple. Take a look at verse 10 here, chapter 2. In him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Now, I've referred to this uh, term before, and I'm going to say it again. This is finished work, brothers and sisters. If you think about it, when Paul says that you are complete in him, it means that you don't need anything else. 2 Peter 1, God's given us everything in him for living the godly life. And when, when I say finished work, what I mean to say is that, you know, Jesus said on the cross, he bowed and said, he said, it is finished. This finished work is not limited to the cross. Yes, he died and he finished dying on the cross to secure eternal redemption, but finished work goes on today in your heart and in my heart. Uh, the key to this is found in Romans chapter 8. Uh, verse. Let me read that, uh, this for you, verse, and you're very familiar with it. Romans 8, verses 28 and 29. Um, See if I can find my 
And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I always say the good, the bad, and the ugly. I said this the other night uh, in talking to somebody in the family. But, uh, you know, it's not really uh, the bad and the ugly. It's all good because God works all things together for good. We may see it as bad and ugly, but it's all good because he uses it all to mold us and shape us and conform, and conform us. Now look at verse 29 here, because this is finished work. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And look, read on. And whom he predestined, these he also, this is finished, called. These he justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. So we have predestined, called, justified, and uh, glorified. That's, that's finished work, folks. And so after Paul says, being made complete in him, he actually goes on to explain now what Christ did for us and how it spiritually translates to being debt-free. Uh, verses 13 through 15 are the heart of this. He, he forgave our sin. He canceled our debt. Metaphorically speaking, he crucified sin. When he was crucified on the cross, he crucified that same sin. And he shamed those who would lead us to believe that we're still spiritually in debt. That's what he did. Now, let's, let's, let's break it down this way. Let's, let's pretend this evening that we're all in debt, okay? And there's no way, and I'm talking materially, but we're going to use the analogy for spiritual. Let's just say that we're all in debt, and there's no way to get out of it. And the walls are not in our favor, and in fact, they're hostile. And we've all been arrested. We're all carried away out of this place at the same time. We're all in prison for not paying our debt. Uh, we would be called, uh, let's say, uh, debt cellmates. Can, I can't imagine spending time in a cell with all you folks. All right. So let's just say that we're all cellmates. Uh, by the way, you go back to before 1833, if you didn't pay your debt, you were arrested, you're thrown in prison. You go back 2,000 years ago, if you didn't pay your debt, you were thrown in prison. They would have understood this. Uh, what is the parable where Jesus says that, you know, the king forgives somebody's debt, and then he goes out and he shakes the other person and says, give me the debt? <laughs> the person was imprisoned in that parable. So, so it wasn't unusual to be arrested or enslaved. So we're all arrested, we're all enslaved. Now, here's our dilemma. They take everything we have. Everything that they can get any cash cow out of, they take it. They take our spouses, and they ship them off to slavery. They take our kids, ship them off to slavery. Take our house, our you name it. Anything you own, they take it all, right? Our very lives were held hostage. We're doomed. Except for this great philanthropist. This person of great means... Great wealth, great grace, great goodness, great mercy, a tremendous heart of compassion, sees all of us as cellmates and says, I don't want to leave you in a cell with Jerry Napping anymore. And I don't want to leave you in a cell with Carl Carlson anymore. And we're going to get all you guys and Drew, especially Drew. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. And we're going to get all you guys out. We're going to get you out. All right? So this great philanthropist not only pays off the debt, but he forgives all the debt. And what he does is he gets his accountant or the people with the ledgers and he races it out. But in the process, what he does is he changes all the walls where we get a legal pardon. As if, as if it never even happened. And that is to say that the law has been satisfied and negated in regard to all of our situations. All right? Totally gone. Then he gets rid of all the hostile creditors and all the bad people who won't let you alone and want to, you know, wring uh, the last little single penny out of your pockets. He gets rid of all the hostile elements, gets us out of jail, 
and gets us back to our loved ones and gets all our stuff back, if you will, gets rid of all the bad credit rating, and you say, praise God for that great philanthropist. But it doesn't stop there. This great philanthropist has a secretary, because I'm sure he wouldn't have time to do it himself, has a secretary call each and every one of us and invites us to dine with him the following night. And he invites us to receive the very, very best from his table. And that phone call comes day after day after, it never stops. The phone call never stops for us to dine. But he's not done. He puts to shame everyone and everything that sought to cancel us and destroy us in every way. That's a great philanthropist, right? Now, I don't think Bill Gates is doing that these days. I don't think Warren Buffett's doing it. Uh, Lord knows Jeff Bezos is not doing it and all these other people. But we have a great philanthropist who has come from heaven to do all these things for us. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. The very powers that would keep us bound up, literally, this is what the Greek says, he's obliterated it. That's what, it, in the Greek, it's oblit he's obliterated and destroyed it. And so, back to the cancel culture, he canceled culture sin, debt, death, darkness, the devil, the curse, everything that was against us. And listen to this, verse 15. He disarmed them, the principalities and powers. He stripped them of any power and any authority and any accusation that could ever be possibly made this side of heaven or the other side of heaven. This is why we call it Good Friday. All the goodness of God. He's paid the debt in every way in the full. As the songwriter said, Jesus paid it all. We're, we're debt free, but we're debt free plus. Now, I'm almost done. What would we say about all of our debt cellmates if they chose to stay in a prison when the doors were wide open. We all leave. Well, most of us leave, but some of us stay. Or what happens if some choose to bear the burden of their debt, even after walking out of the cell? Or what happens if they choose to work after they get out of the cell, for the rest of their lives, seeking to pay somebody, like that great philanthropist, back toward their debt that they could never, ever repay. What would we say to them? What would you say to your debt cellmate who did not come out, who tried to work when they came out, or chose to bear that debt forever? Uh, I've come up with some ideas. or some, we, we call them crazy. We would call them irrational. We would say that they're misinformed, unenlightened, and maybe perhaps even a sorry soul. Would we not? We would, we would want to shake them and say, don't you get it? Uh, to think that someone would stay in bondage, and people do. People stay in bondage. Brothers and sisters stay in bondage, and they just can't seem to get beyond it. You know, earlier uh, I may have indicated or said that debt ruins people. That's why, you know, you file bankruptcy with the hope that you get a fresh start and you might be able to get out of debt. Um, how much more so spiritual debt ruins us all? So as I, as I close tonight, uh, the prayer would be that none of us find ourselves in these spiritually debt-prone conditions, uh, because we're not. Uh, that we're not held captive or hostage. 
uh, and that we possess the very, very freedom in him that Calvary affords each and every one of us. Uh, as I read this passage of Scripture, uh, I think that this has got, been God's heart's desire from day one. He always looked to the cross to finish it. And I think that's been his heart's desire from the beginning. And um, I think it's been his heart's desire that all of us learn to be that spiritually free as he intended that we would be. Anyway, that's what God has laid upon my heart this evening. Uh, let's uh, transition to communion. And we are going to sing uh, hymn number 161.